Hey, let's talk to Megan Bruxile. She's a planetary scientist from Livermore. Megan, thank you for hanging on. I appreciate it. Sure. Glad to be here. You're part of, a, you, I'm reading this, but I almost don't believe it, U.S. government planetary defense team. This sounds like something out of a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we take uh, uh, national security very seriously here. At I'm Lord sorry, North. I didn't, I'm not mocking you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm relieved. Are we at risk from asteroids? Uh, there, there are none known currently to be a risk to the Earth, but there are a lot that are still undetected at this point. They're in the hundreds to meter size range or smaller. And so we want to be prepared in the event that there is one that's going to be a, a hazard to the Earth. They've hit the Earth before, right? Oh yeah, big ones, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the dinosaurs, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's the most famous uh, large impact of uh, in recent or not so re recent, 65 million years ago at this point. But. Yeah, but it's not fantasy. I mean, we could see the craters, we could yeah. see the results from these things. And how devastating would something like this be? Is it like in the movies? Uh, it, uh, well, the movies clearly are going to uh, <laughs> hyperbolize some of some of this stuff. So. Um, <laughs> Clearly, the you know what you would see in Armageddon or Deep Impact isn't a realistic portrayal of what the threat would be. At this, at this point, anything that's a kilometer or larger in size yeah. uh, is, is very well constrained. Their orbits are very well constrained, and so they're not going to be um, threatening the Earth anytime soon. Oh, that's interesting. So we know where they are, and we can tell that they're they're not a hazard to us going distantly into the future. Right, for the, for the really big ones, okay. yeah. There's only so many of the really big ones. As you get down to smaller sizes, there's many more of that size range that, are, that could be a threat. And, and how much of a threat? What kind, what, what's the scenario? Well, so I think uh, looking back in recent times, you can look at the Chelyabinsk impact in Russia, which occurred in 2013. That one was only about 20 meters across. Uh, wasn't detected ahead of time, clearly. Still injured about 1,500 people, mostly from blowing out windows and things. Right. And uh, if it had occurred over a more populated area, it could have been much more devastating. So clearly, there's there's a size range for which we still don't have a, a, a perfect understanding of where they are and when they're going to hit. The mass, the the great mass of these things burn up in the atmosphere. They they become, you know, uh, uh, fall, shooting stars, right? This is one, in fact, we have a lot of video of this because of dash cams popularity in Russia that actually landed. Look Jeez. at that thing. That's scary. That's horrifying. So, <laughs> uh, so are you tracking objects at this small size? Uh, so detection or tracking of, of asteroids is really in the realm of NASA. So uh, NASA JPL's uh, Near-Earth Object Office pulls in observations from all of the ground-based and space-based observatories that are hunting for asteroids all the time. So they have a centralized uh, database of, of all of their orbits, and so they know what are the probabilities of impact for all of these different objects. Um, here at the lab, we focus on if there was a, a one that was going to impact, what could we do to prevent it? How interesting. So tell me about some of the how blue sky is this? I mean, you think about giant nets. What? Laser. I mean, is there lasers? lasers. Yeah, so satellites. What, what uh, kind of stuff are we talking <laughs> about here? Yeah. So the the two methods that we focus on here are the two most mature technologies at this point to handle uh, an asteroid that would be a threat, and that is first is a kinetic impactor, which uh, is just a, simply a spacecraft that would ram into an asteroid at high speed, and so it's going to uh, clearly deliver all of its momentum into the asteroid, but then there's this extra boost of momentum from any of the crater ejecta that is going in the opposite direction. I want to say you guys have a video of this here. Um, this is a simulation we've done at, at the lab using the spheral hydrocode. Um, so a kinetic impactor is a, is a real simple method for, for deflecting an asteroid, just changing its velocity by on the order of a few of a centimeter per second or, or somewhere along those lines. As long as you do it early enough, it'll move it and uh, move it far enough off of the Earth's uh, path that it won't impact the Earth. So, um, so it's basically like a snowplow, but for an asteroid, almost. Yeah, 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 you're just moving it very gently, and over time, the that change in velocity will translate into a large distance, and it'll miss the Earth. Yeah. Um, but there, so the other the other method, which uh, we we do, we do a lot of simulations of this at the lab as well, is kinetic impactors can only handle asteroids that are um, fairly small and detected with a lot of warning time. If you have a, a, something on a larger size, more than 
a couple hundred meters across or so, or the warning time is shorter, you just we don't have the rockets to get enough mass there to move the asteroid off off of an Earth impacting trajectory. So the other option is to send uh, a nuclear device. It would be deployed uh, some distance from the surface of the asteroid. All of the the uh, energetic particles and photons from the device would be deposited in uh, the uppermost surface layers of the asteroid. All that material would be then vaporized and blow off in the, in the opposite direction. And then the asteroid would recoil slightly in the other direction. So you're just, you're, you're really keeping most of the asteroid intact. You're only affecting the, the surface and the rest of the asteroid is moving in the other direction. So, so, it seems like, so it seems like it's less focused on destroying the asteroid and more just moving it out of our way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. gentle nudges. Uh -huh. <laughs> And are you guys, uh, in addition to looking at the Earth, are you looking at the Moon as well too? Like, or anything like is that included in your detection area? Uh, looking at impacts on the Moon, yeah. or um, so anything that came um, within the Earth Moon system would would be included. Uh, That's pretty darn uh, yeah. close. Yeah, yeah. So I figured, you get yeah, within yeah. a quarter million miles. Yeah. We're a little too, a little close yeah. for comfort. Yeah. Yeah. How is this right. a new effort, or have we been doing this all along? It feels like this is something we. We really weren't thinking about until recently. Yeah, I think here here at the lab, uh, people have been working on this problem for over 20 years, at least thinking about how you could use different methods to deflect asteroids. Um, and I think as we as the observational capabilities have improved over the last 25 years or so, and we found more and more of these small bodies, we have a better picture of what the threat really is. And um, and I think that Chelyabinsk impact in Russia was a call to action for a, yeah. for a lot of international leaders. And so yeah. there is a kind of renewed focus on what can we do to prevent it. Do we have the capability now or uh, is this something we're planning for in the future? If something was coming at us and we just found out about it, what would we do today? Right. So we, we have the capability now. We don't have a spacecraft sitting ready to be launched now. But so that would take something on the order of a, a year or two to get something on a rocket and launched. But we have the kinetic and nuclear technologies necessary to uh, to move something off of would, an Earth impacting course. Would we get a year uh, warning? Yeah. Would we get that much warning? Uh, yeah, we, we would. Uh, for deflection to work, typically you're going to need many years warning. Um, if you have sh less than a year, the only option would be probably emergency response or possibly trying to disrupt it. So trying to fully fragment it and, and robustly disperse all of the fragments. Wow. So that's a, that's a different strategy. There's completely. also a, a, a laser system, is that right? Or you're looking at? Uh, so we have a, a facility here called the Jupiter Laser Facility. And we're, the reason we're using that for some experiments is we're trying to understand more about asteroidal materials. So our best analogs for asteroid materials here on Earth would be meteorites that we've found. And so using these meteorite samples, we use the lasers to shock them to very high pressures and then see how they, uh, they behave under these high pressure conditions, how they fragment and fail. And so we learn more about the, the strength models that we should incorporate into our numerical simulations by doing these experiments on realistic asteroid materials. She's, uh, Megan's working at the Lawrence Livermore National Labs, which is a really amazing, just up the road a piece from us. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of explosive work. And here's a picture of Megan with the NASA Ames, this is down in the South Bay by Google, vertical gun range. <laughs> what is that? Oh, it's a great facility. So I, I did all my PhD work at Brown, um, working at the ABGR. A lot of we did a lot of experiments with Pete Schultz there. Um, it's it's incredible. Behind you, you can see the blue thing is a giant vacuum chamber where the, the target would be placed, and that orange thing is a giant lever arm that can uh, go up to different impact angles and shoot things into the target chamber. <laughs> at different angles. So, so you can this, see the ports, yeah, that yeah. goes through the ports. So this is testing uh, the effect of the impacts then? Yes, so it was built um, during the Apollo era originally to, to simulate uh, the craters on the moon. So to understand ah, that. Yeah. Okay. But now being used to uh, find out how we deflect. Uh, what, is, what are the chances, though, of this <laughs> happening? Is this a high level of risk or a low where do we stand I mean, what's the that? mathematical probability yeah. of this <laughs> right well uh, for the small guys things are 
20 meters in size, like Chelyabinsk, those are fairly frequent. Um, oh, wow. Something like Tunguska, which was in the early 20th century over Siberia, uh, that was only 70 meters and was hugely devastating. It, it leveled about uh, 2,000 square kilometers of forest. So if that had happened over a metropolitan area, it could have been really horrible. And so those those are not that infrequent. Clearly, the ones that are much larger, hundreds of meters, those are those are less frequent. But the consequences are high, and so even even when things uh, are relatively low probability, if the consequences are very very high, uh, they they bear looking looking at closely and being prepared for. No oh kidding. How, how big is the team that you're on working on all this? Like how 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 much how many resources are being put towards the planetary defense? Yeah, it's a relatively modest amount of resources here at the lab. There's a big group of people, but they work um, at kind of 10 percent or 20 percent time on it, but. We're able to leverage a lot of different uh, expertise by, by doing it in that group format, a team format like that. It sounds fascinating, actually. And it must be great on your, does your business card actually say planetary defense group? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, no. man, come on. Got to get makeup one at least, you know, like an ID, you know. <laughs> so so when you when you watch movies like Armageddon or Deep Impact, is it more like eye rolling or is it more or can you enjoy can you separate it and enjoy the the uh, Hollywood fictionalization of it? <laughs> yeah, I think if you're able to enjoy it, view it as more fantasy and right. enjoy the story, it's fine. But you have to recognize that the science is isn't accurate and sure. uh, and make sure you explain to anyone that asks that, that you know. <laughs> That's not how it would work in real life. At the same time, there's some value in raising the awareness, sure. which would help raise funding, because obviously this is something that uh, it would be a sensible thing for governments to look at. Are other governments doing this? Is it a joint task force? I mean, it's all our Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it is ultimately an international problem. And I think a, a good uh, example of how it can be uh, dealt with internationally is the first planned test of the kinetic impactor strategy is an international mission. So it's a collaboration between uh, the European Space Agency and NASA. This is called the AIDA mission. And it's a mission to uh, a binary asteroid, so an asteroid with a little moon around it. They're going to, uh, the European component will go there ahead of time, characterize the system very, very uh, thoroughly with a suite of instruments. And then the American component, the DART impactor, will come in and impact the smaller the, the smaller asteroid in the binary, the little moon going around the larger one, and then we'll be able to detect how much its velocity changed. So it's a real life test of how this could work and, and definitely uh, making things international is, is a more realistic uh, a capturing of, of the yeah. type of strategy we would need in yeah. a real event. I think of uh, my friend Jerry Pornell's wonderful novel, Lucifer's Hammer, which is mm -hmm. all about the uh, Really, less about the science of the of a comet impact, but more about what would happen uh, to civilization if a if a big one hit us. And uh, it just you know, it's I'm glad we're preparing, we're we're considering this. The one the one that made me think of the moon is uh, Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves. Seven Eves, yeah. Where an impact hits the moon and breaks the moon in pieces, and then uh, then everything that happens from there. And so yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we got to protect horrifying. the whole area, <laughs> the whole area here. Jeez. Well, it's really great to talk to you, Megan. Thank you for filling us in a little bit on uh, your work as a planetary defender. I, I think you should get a suit of some, a uniform. I think at least some sort of logo. Cape, some sort of, yeah. A logo. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're just teasing you. I really, I'm really glad that this is going on. We're glad to help uh, raise awareness. Megan Bruxile is a planetary scientist uh, working uh, at the Lawrence Livermore National Labs on what might happen uh, right. should a earth a body approach the earth and we need to we need to move it out what's the closest something's come and not hit us is there any like because you think of the big events like if it were i mean 20 meters 40 meters yeah. but what if it were a kilometer across that would be that would that could conceivably end civilization as we know it right yeah the, the kilometer across would have global effects um the dinosaur killing impact is about 10 kilometers across wow. so it wouldn't be All that right. magnitude so but... it's big yeah that was big so uh have we had close encounters i mean if we, we 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 just dodged a bullet or or in our recent memory or are you allowed to talk about it yeah it's a secret <laughs> no, none of this is a secret um okay. you can check the jpl near earth object website and, and look at all the orbits and I love look at that. The, Past, past, present, and future orbits um, to see when the when a variety of size bodies come close to the Earth. Um, but things come regularly inside of the Earth-Moon 
radius. So um, things come by pretty close sometimes, and it just depends on their orbit, whether uh, they're really going to be a threat. So the distance it gets to the Earth is uh, and will be a threat is also determined by yeah. its specific orbit. Yeah. This so. is all I know about asteroids. Yeah, this is, this is the, close, this is the, the closest, closest I've come. ever come. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have one of those little triangle ships? <laughs> so. we, need, we need more. Megan, thank you so much for joining us on the new thank screen you. series. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Well, no, stop it with the asteroids. <laughs> it's fun to hear that again, isn't it? I'm uh, glad that we have people doing that. You know, I like, I didn't know we did. I have no idea either. And I, mean, I thought, yeah. you know, we're just kind of yeah. waltzing through space hoping nothing bad happens. Yeah. No, we got some smart people. Yeah, which is good. Paying attention. Which is good because God forbid something actually happens, we need to keep Aerosmith from recording a new song. Oh, my God. That's, yeah. the, that's mm -hmm. the utmost important. And Bruce Willis isn't going to live forever, folks. All right. <laughs>